Harmon. Uh, he will be presenting uh, current research that he's working on about sort of the human trafficking and internal displacement within the Roman world in particular. Um, Dr. Furman uh, started off his academic uh, career, I suppose, at the University of Kentucky, where in 1999 he received a BA in Classics and History. Uh, he then went on to a Master's at Kentucky in Classics in 2001, and then trans transitioned over into the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he got another Master's in History in um, 2000. Yeah, 2001 ish again. Um, and then in 2005, he uh, completed his PhD at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, uh, focusing on sort of frontier studies in the Roman world, uh, which sort of lended uh, to his book project, uh, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2012, called Policing the Roman Empire. Uh, we're very uh, happy to have uh, Dr. Harmon here to uh, uh, share his, his current research, and I hope you will welcome uh, him with a, a warm welcome. And um, I wanted to thank all of you for coming out today in this room today and uh, just express how happy I am to uh, be here with you at the University of New Mexico. I want to thank the university, I want to thank the Goran Fund and the Department of History, as well as Dr. Nick Overton for doing so much to make this happen. How is this volume? It's going to turn this down a little bit too much. This is just hard. Kind of heavy base. Okay. Well, yeah. Civil Wars that destroyed the Roman Republic. 
and wipe out the decentralized administration of the Roman Republic. Further, I argue that, number two, issues related to human trafficking were essential to the transformation of the Roman state from Republic to Empire. It was also a central concern of the man who led that transition, the person we end up calling Augustus, the first, we consider the first emperor of Rome. We're going to talk a good deal about Augustus, so I'll, I'll state his dates. And we start calling him an emperor in the year 27 BC, and, uh, and, and he reigns into his death much later uh, in the year 14 C. Number three, analysis of various types of sources shows that the Roman state and its growing legal apparatus continued to fight for the trafficking in later centuries. They tried to make an effort. The Roman state engaged actual resources to fight what I think they would conceive of as human trafficking. But they, weren't always, uh, they were not always successful. Number four, human trafficking occurred across international borders. But more important for my focus today, it also occurred within the empire. And we will focus especially on unurbanized, rough, isolated areas in certain zones of disruption or minimal Roman control. These arguments lead me to conclude that from the perspective of the state, <coughs> Roman emperors were keen to fight what they might call human trafficking. But a Roman understanding of this problem would, would be a significantly different one from our own. The Roman state definition of human trafficking will emerge, in fact, over the course of my presentation. And let's also note some inherent challenges of this kind of inquiry. I don't know if some of you are visitors from the history department, but we might work on 19th century British history, or something like that. Those of you who are, are you know, kind of visitors from more recent modern historical periods, you would probably be shocked at the poverty and paucity of ancient sources on many basic questions of trafficking and servitude. It's a bit like putting together a jigsaw puzzle with most of the pieces missing and no picture on the front of the box to guide you. Really kind of feeling around the line. However, we have enough to make to, to sketch an argument. And along the way, we'll see many notable interesting bits of evidence. We also have to, before we really begin, lay out some essential facts about ancient slavery. Unlike slavery in the Americas, skin color was not a significant marker of someone you could assume was probably an enslaved individual. Slavery was a given, unquestioned and unchallenged by any kind of abolition. One anecdote I'd like to point to that suggests this is there was a handful of slave revolts in antiquity. And when these were temporarily successful, and slaves would set up their own society for time. They had slaves. It's just they didn't want to be the ones who had slaves. And of course, the master's right to own human beings as slaves was a recognized right in all ancient Mediterranean states. Some slaves had fairly decent lives, but overall, Roman slavery was brutal and demeaning institution. These slaves are fully human, real people who existed just as much as you or I. And naturally, Roman slaves sought ways to escape servitude, or at least make their lives better. This included running away, a very common tactic, and again, in three cases, large-scale slave revolts in the 130s, the 100s, and the 70s BC. Romans could acquire slaves at legal open markets. Before Rome established full hegemony in the Mediterranean over the course of the first century BCE, Constant wars fed these markets. I think I need to advance this slide. No. Um, yeah, I mean, some of these wars are outlined here. I'm not going to take you through every war, but to point out that a lot of them result in the acquisition of a massive number of, of, of slaves. I don't believe the Julius Caesar number, uh, to be fair, that is over the course of fighting for 10 years in many countries, no doubt about a lot of slaves. I'm not sure if this is really familiar. But, you know, it was definitely in the hundreds of thousands, depending on the campaign. Okay? So wars fed the slave market. Throughout antiquity, it was a universally accepted fact 
that if one community was locked in a total war with another community, the winners could kill or enslave the losers. The latter was a favorable option for sheer profit. All ancient states that were in positions to enslave defeated foes did so, including Rome. In fact, the likely etymology of the Roman word for slave, sandals, is related to our English verbs conserve or reserve, with the idea of taking or better keeping. Servi were initially defeated survivors who were, quote, kept rather than killed. At the conclusion of military sieges or other military campaigns, slave traders who often followed armies might appear on site and purchase these unfortunate captives, then take them and sell them elsewhere for a significant profit. Or the victors can move their captives themselves, themselves to a nearby market. One of the most famous and most notable market by the time we get to the, I guess, the second, late second century C uh, BCE is the island of Delos. It's a small island uh, off the shore of Greece. And uh, I'm not sure this is a slave market. This is probably a reconstructed market. We're not sure if it's 100% you know, devoted to slaves. But according to the Roman, well, Roman era geographical writer Strabo, boats were coming in continuously and routinely moved tens of thousands of slaves through there a day. And I just want to sketch out a concrete scenario, a uh, quasi-fictional of one of these slaves, and just to make sure we all have um, a solid understanding of what's going on there. So let's go to Thrace. Thrace is a, a mountainous region north of Greece. Kind of a rough area. Uh, it's outside of Roman control at this point. Let's say there's a random Thracian guy named Spartax. The word I'm saying is Spartax. Good Thracian name. Let's say it's the early first century BC, well before Rome controlled this area. Spartax belongs to a Thracian tribe, which is in a full-on war with a neighboring tribe. His tribe loses the war and suffers further defeat. He and other survivors are at the total mercy of the winners, who take them to a nearby slave dealer or market afterwards and sell them there. The buyer might send Spartax and other enslaved Thracian tribesmen to the thriving slave market on the island of Delos. There he might be sold to an Italian slave dealer who would then ship this new, quote, property to southern Italy, where he would sell them in turn to an owner of one of the many enormous plantations operating in Italy during the first century BC. It's all the evil business, isn't it? But it is not what I mean by human trafficking in my analysis today. Frankly, everything that happened to poor Spartax was considered natural and legal by ancient standards. The trick then is to, to delineate legal versus illegal slave markets and sales. I'm sure that if we could ask an enslaved person like Spartax, he would feel like a human trafficking victim. Uh, I'm sure he would apply every negative label to his miserable experience. But for better or worse, in my analysis here, I'm taking a statist view, viewing these questions from the perspective of the state. I'm trying to see it like the state because it's the latter growth of the Roman state and its ambitions that make human trafficking a sensible area of analysis for our questions today. In order to show this and to differentiate uh, between legal versus illegal slave dealing, we have to go all the way back to Dark Age Greece. To the very beginnings of Greek literature, the Dark Age epics of Homer. Homer's Iliad and Odyssey describe the world in which the state institutions were exceedingly primitive, in which shame, religious customs, warrior ethos, and guest friendship play more important roles in controlling behavior than any notion of quote state government. The bellicose narratives of the Iliad allude to several incidents of post-war enslavement during the Trojan War. And these show that what happened to Spartax was already routine in the 8th century BC or earlier. When it comes to Odysseus's wanderings, he's another hero from the America, in the Odyssey, the, sh the storm tossed survivor ends up finishing much of his journey back home alone and destitute. As a tricky advisor of tall tales, 
But this case often explains his poor circumstances by falsely claiming he was kidnapped by pirates. Some of the most positively portrayed members, humble members of Odysseus' household back in Ithaca, are unfree individuals who were long ago enslaved in similar circumstances. Pirate raids, bandit attacks, for example. They're not happy about it. And sometimes they'll lament their misfortunes that brought them here. But in Homer's Odyssey, everyone, all the characters are always complaining about everything. So, you know, it's just something to complain about. Kidnapping and enslavement were part of the natural order, the native economy, if you will. Those who suffered it spoke as if they were blaming, say, a storm for, or other impersonal act of nature for wrecking the ship. They accepted the nature of things. So that's earliest Greece. As the polis or city state developed in archaic Greece during the 7th century and later, an inherently strong community identity started to be matched by an expanded sense of law and recourse to state centric norms. One measure of this term from rampant slave taking is the knowing distance we see in Book One of Thucydides, in which the 5th century historian described a world in which piracy and kidnapping and enslavement had been an accepted part of life in the distant past. So the old Greeks did kidnapping and enslavement. It didn't mean any disgrace for those who earned their livelihood in this way. But it's very telling that he credits the growth um, of Corinth's navy, the major naval power of Corinth, um, with suppressing piracy and moving the Greeks away from the slave taking world of Odysseus. There is some truth to this claim that it, a strong navy, uh, led by a strong state, uh, Offerings at the expense of, of piracy and helps control piracy. Because we see that piratical slave traders in the Mediterranean often drive in the absence of naval hegemony, like Corinth was operating at that time. But the formation of what we might call a civilized norm does not entirely depend on direct state military power. It's not all about the army or the navy. In fact, inscriptions and other sources from archaic and early classical Greece show that all the wars between city-states were frequent, they tended not to be total wars. Pan-Hellenic institutions and interstate arbitration discouraged total war, with some exceptions. There were a lot of intercity agreements specifically forbidding receiving runaway slaves from their new ally cities, and vice versa. These cooperative arrangements show a growing state-focused awareness that some forms of slave acquisition were becoming unacceptable by the 6th century BCE. But in archaic Athens and in early Rome, only <coughs> free citizens could uh, become slaves by going into debt. This is called debt slavery. Excuse me. We have fairly good evidence from Athens of the social tension that debt slavery caused and the gradual revulsion society felt for the practice. Rome and Athens both moved away from domestic debt slavery and focused instead increasingly on protecting their own citizens from enslavement. Rather than allowing fellow Romans or fellow Athenians to feed the international slave market because of debt, they each became much more focused on profiting and feeding that market by enslaving other peoples as defeated combatants in their many imperialist wars. As Athenian naval power grew in the 5th century, and her imperial ambitions with it, Athens began taking slaves on a massive scale by picking fights with weaker island states that resisted them. It was certainly ugly and aggressive, but again, Athenian slave taking was a state-sanctioned activity, and therefore not what I call human trafficking for the purposes of this lecture. As we head into the Hellenistic era, by the late 3rd century BCE, the island of Rhodes established itself as something of a naval hegemon. I'll show you where Rhodes is in a minute. There's a map coming up. But it's an island uh, today a little bit south of Turkey. Okay? And Rhodes, I'm sorry, Rhodes' naval power discouraged piracy throughout the eastern Mediterranean. Okay? And notice I'm going to be speaking about banditry and piracy as tantamount to kidnapping and enslavement. Right. Here's where Rhodes starts entering the picture. 
As the Roman state extended its power eastwards, at the expense of Rhodes and other Hellenistic states, it created a power vacuum that allowed for piracy to flare up in the region, especially in Crete and in Cilicia. These are uh, Cilicia's of the region of southern Asia Minor. In fact, piracy was naturally endemic throughout the entire Mediterranean, and closer to home, there were major centers of piracy near Italy in Sicily and the Balearic Islands south of Spain. If you're a fan of Greek and Roman literature, one thing to think about for this time period, this kind of late Hellenistic time period, is how important piracy and kidnapping and enslavement were in the plots of the literature. Uh, this is the age of new comedy. And, you know, piratical tip, uh, kidnapping is just a kind of routine staple of a comic plot by playwrights like Menander and Plautus, in both a kind of Greek angle and Roman angles. There's one character in a play by Plautus, she happens to be a high class courtesan, um, a high class prostitute essentially, who uh, changes hands 14 times because of the, the woes of her misfortune and flipping back and forth between different characters. And Plautus, in fact, has a whole play called the Captivity, that is dedicated uh, you know, to a number of people who were, who were captured in this way. Okay. So um, this is, you know, when you look at the rise of Rome in the 200s BC or the 100s BC, their form of government at this time, of course, is a republic. Lacking a unitary executive, uh, the, the republic is led by the Senate, and the Roman Senate occasionally commissioned special naval commands to suppress piratical hotspots. These special commands uh, against pirates, um, they did little lasting good. And by the 70s, there was a crisis, just a, a, an absolute crisis. Uh, at one point, a young Julius Caesar ends up being kidnapped and ransomed by pirates. Um, sometime also around that, that time period, Rome's port was raided by pirates. And most humiliating, in the year 74, a praetor, an important Roman official, was moving on a major road in southern Italy with his entire entourage when they were ambushed by pirates and kidnapped. And so it's, it, it amounted to a series of humiliations, and a trade and travel nearly impossible in the Mediterranean. This led to a special commission of Roman states and Pompey, giving this fellow Pompey an all-encompassing command over the entire Mediterranean in 63 BC. And that did settle piracy for some decades. And told Rome civil wars allowed and encouraged piracy and every other sort of disorder. The final victory of Augustus, uh, who we'll call Augustus in the, third, in, in the year 30 BC, not only ended these wars and ushered in uh, over two centuries of relative peace, it also effectively made the Mediterranean Sea a Roman lake. Okay? So this map is um, from a little bit later, but by 30 BC, really Rome is in total control of what they end up calling Mare Nostrum, or Our Sea. Some of the places we've been talking about, for example, here are the Balearic Islands, which is the center of piracy. We talk about Corsica, Sardinia, Sicily, really the piracy throughout. But this is where it's worst. <laughs> also, the island of Crete. Um, this is Cilicia, it's kind of uh, this rock rocky area of uh, <coughs> Turkey. And this is the island of Rhodes that kept that kind of thing at bay for a long time. And Diolos is one of these little nasty rocks somewhere around here. Okay. So, anyway, now we have a unitary empire and a unitary executive. Okay. The radical kidnappings of the Hellenists in the early Roman periods, it's getting towards what I might call human trafficking from the Roman state. But the problem from the state-centric view leading to Roman hegemony was two centuries of incomplete Roman control or hegemony leading up to it. When Rome was powerful enough to weaken Carthage, to weaken Corinth, to weaken Rhodes and old and other older naval powers without really replicating their naval strength, providing the same kind of service that those states had done in uh, controlling and securing the sea. 
The primal kidnappings and slave trade of the second and first centuries BCD certainly verged towards human trafficking, but the chaotic shifting nature of contested power in the Mediterranean deprives our state-centric approach of a unified center of power and legitimacy from which to oppose human trafficking. To put it another way, if the Mediterranean was divided between several contested powers around year 100 BCD, what about the pirate kings of Cilicia or Crete? Aren't they just <coughs> another one of these claimants to power operating in the international theater? It makes a real difference when this area is unified under one political entity. Otherwise, who's to say they're not legitimate? The pirates, that is. Okay. Augustus, as emperor from 27 BCE to 14 CE, developed a stable imperial administrative system. He got into that position through things that were not pretty. He was a young, merciless combatant in a bloody civil war that followed Julius Caesar's assassination in 44 BCE. Over the course of his long life, Augustus had to reshape his image from a bloodthirsty warlord to a stabilizing, constructive preserver of Roman greatness. One key way Augustus established the stability of his new order and his own legitimacy, was to clarify the distinction between slavery and freedom. Romans tended to think in stark dichotomies. Gaius, a uh, later author of an influential Roman law textbook, began his work by stressing that, quote, the most fundamental distinction in the law of persons is this, that all men are either free men or slaves. The chaos of the late republic blurred this comfortable distinction in exceedingly problematic ways. With rampant slave flight and three major revolts on the one hand, and enslavement of free people on the other. Augustus and his successors sought to enforce Gaius's slave slash free dichotomy throughout the empire, as did responsible digital administrators and the legal system itself over the next three centuries. One way we see this is in Rome's carefully coordinated efforts to keep slaves from running away um, and, and, and tracking down slaves who did run away. Okay? And we'll talk about that uh, in a moment. Okay. Augustus's first priority on merging out of the chaotic civil wars was preventing abandoned and pirates from illegally enslaving Roman citizens in Italy itself. Okay. Augustus himself quoted that I freed the sea from pirates. Right? And um, this is from a propagandistic inscription we have that is essentially his deathbed autobiography at the end of his life in year 14 AD. So called Grace Guest by the New York And he's actually alluding here to a civil war campaign in the 30s in which his enemy's fleets were largely manned by runaway slaves. This was propaganda to an extent, yes. But this kind of propaganda of peace, it was, it was something that people had a voracious appetite for. One scholar has even recently argued that Augustus's efforts against piracy played a strong role in his eventual divination. And even with uh, his Eastern subjects already worshiping him as a living god. Italy, however, was slow to recover from the civil wars. Even after Octavian's victory, Italy continued to suffer from dire disorder. Here's a passage from the, I'm sorry, the uh, historian Acting of Alexandria writing around the year 100 CE, <coughs> noting how many problems were, were left over. Um, and that, you know, Octavian is using his power, and using state power to do something about it in order to, 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 to try to stop it. I think it's overblown. I, I don't trust Appian. He's, he's, he's too, you know, he, he's being far too positive. But it's clear that Augustus was concerned that he was doing something. Yeah, I, in fact, it's, it's pretty clear. I'm going to shift gears now, but it, it, it's pretty clear that. The problems of banditry and kidnapping in Italy, they really didn't go away. It's an ongoing thing that the emperors, the early emperors, had to keep working on, keep fighting. Okay. 
And in fact, a lot of this work was done by Augustus' stepson and eventual successor, Tiberius, who reigned in his own right as emperor uh, from years 14 to 37 C. Okay? But what I'm arguing here is that fixing these problems with that slave free distinction being blurred, free people being kidnapped, this was essential to the ethos of the new regime. It was absolutely essential to um, Augustus showing himself as a stable and legitimate and good thing for the Roman community. Okay? Let's go back to our definitions for a moment. Here's what I would proffer uh, here down at the bottom. These are the definitions. Here's my Roman definition. Here's what I would proffer as a useful definition of human trafficking in the Roman Empire from a Roman perspective. The enslavement by kidnapping the free people within the Roman Empire. Simple as that. Okay? And it helps when the, you know, the whole Mediterranean world comes under Roman control. That kind of is what does it. Firm Roman hegemony removes the complications of fragmented authority. I think that weakness in my definition, the thing you're going to quibble with, is probably the word kidnapping. Be a little flexible with me here, okay? All right. I'm trying. <laughs> we'll be we'll see some things that aren't exactly kidnapping is a little bit too much of a charge word. I almost want to say like taking, you know. Kidnapping might be a little too strong. Sometimes it's good. I'm so so you guys have to know. Anyway, we'll talk about that during Q and A. Um, this is an attempt at utilitarian definition. It still raises some key issues when comparing it to modern and draft. And one thing to think about is this. Our concern over human trafficking today focuses on, focuses on sympathy for its victims. We are meant to fight trafficking in most cases, not because it hurts us directly or you directly. It's more usually out of benign altruism and outrage over the suffering of trafficked individuals. And I'm, I'm completely on board with that. I'm not this kind of altruistic sympathy was not operative in the Roman Empire. Partly because the Romans were just not very sympathetic people. <laughs> but also because of the universality of legal slavery. The horror stories that outrage us today in human traffic tragedies happening right now, they were routine facets of the slave system back then. And so there's a real shift of perspective between what you know Roman human traffic opposition would be versus how we define it and look at it today. What matters in the shift of perspective is who was trafficked, by whom, and where. Basically, if a kid is kidnapped outside the empire, taken into the empire, then sold as a slave, you know, ends up in Italy or whatever, that's fine from a Roman perspective. It's fine from a legal perspective. Rather than sheer sympathy, Romans, countering my definition of human trafficking, they, they were against this, um, not out of sympathy for individual woes. They, they, they didn't like this because they wanted to, to protect the slavery system itself. And they wanted to uphold other important elements of the Roman legal system. Like this fundamental distinction between free status and slave status. So Romans hated the blurring of that distinction, freedom versus slavery. They hated it so much they implemented fairly complicated police efforts, in fact, against both kidnapping profiteers and against slave parts. This is what I was fishing for earlier. Sorry, I woke something up, I'm sorry. Um, this is the kind of schema of how I argue policing kind of work, or what, what way to kind of arrange the different levels of policing. Um, and, you know, policing tended not to be terribly well organized or coordinated. There were a lot of different types of police authority. But one thing they really took a lot of efforts in over the centuries is combating this blurring distinction between free and slave, especially by hunting down or trying to hunt down one of these slaves. And they really throw everything they can at it at every coordinated level of authority. Okay? 
okay? uh, involving both uh, uh, military means of, of their power and also um, more civilian things like that. I would say. So that, you know, they're throwing everything they have at this. Okay? So uh, the prime motive, I think, for these Roman efforts was Augustus's political needs in Italy at the end of the Civil Wars. By that time, Romans regarded Italy as their special homeland. Nearly everyone in the Italian peninsula had Roman citizenship, citizenship by this time. While outside of Italy, in the provinces, few people had Roman citizenship. It's no surprise that Augustus' initial motives was to protect Roman citizens from illegal human trafficking. And this remained a privileged concern over the next centuries. However, as Augustus' administrative system solidified, the state's concern to fight illegal slave taking was not limited to only Roman citizens. They paid attention to this problem even if the victim wasn't Roman. What mattered is if the victim was free or not. Also, consider that there's a certain universalism in the Roman concept of what it might mean to be Roman, especially after the year 212, when the emperor kind of makes almost everybody in the empire a Roman citizen. But back to the slave free dichotomy. We have evidence of the state showing concern towards provincial non citizens who are born free, but then end up slaves. The most notable example of this is from an exchange of letters between the Emperor Trajan and the Roman governor of Bithynia in what is now Turkey around the year 111 CE. We have about 50 pairs of these letters in which the governor, who was the notable Senator Pliny the Younger, brought problems in his province to Trajan's attention. One such problem is related to the exposure of unwanted newborn babies, which is common, legal, and uncontroversial in the ancient world before the triumph of the Abrahamic monotheistic faiths. Unwanted infants would be taken out into the countryside, into the countryside and abandoned, and there, sadly, they would probably die. But sometimes, if you were traveling through a, a remote area, you might find a living um, child. Uh, we call these foundlings. And I think the attitude is, hey, free baby. <laughs> and uh, you, could, you could essentially adopt that baby and use it as a dear and free child. But you could also say, hey, free slave. And that uh, was probably a pretty common way of feeding the slave market in antiquity. And again, it's completely normal, completely uncontroversial, as terrible as it is. Plenty the Younger, as governor of Athenia around year 111, was facing complaints from free people who were raised as slaves. And these people who had been raised as slaves could somehow prove that they were actually exposed children, but exposed by free parents. And I hope no one will ask me what, how exactly anyone knows this, but they just kind of say, okay, they, they believe them for some reason. The question for these Roman officials was, what do we do with these people? Should they be freed? Should they remain slaves under their current circumstances? I mean, they kind of always thought they were slaves at first. And then the question becomes, if we free them, should they have to pay back the cost of their rearing? It's like the slave owners, they want to cut. It's like, we raised this baby, and it did no work for us. You know, little kids, are they going to do any work? Okay? And, you know, they, they like, wanted some money out of this to kind of help handle the financial loss, the real investment business. Okay. Both the governor and the emperor expend real energy looking through archives, looking through books, trying to find legal clarity and precedence. Pliny found one precedent, they have gone back to Augustus, and it seems that this material they're finding was generally favorable to the claims of the foundlings who say, we should be free. And Trajan, whose word was law anyways, you see in a lot of his reply. He decided that such people should be free. And that they shouldn't even have to pay back the cost of their rearing to their former masters. Uh, again, the slave free dichotomy is absolute. Um, in other words, Trajan agrees with my Roman definition. He 
saw these cases as free people who were illegally enslaved. And subsequently, Roman legal uh, opinion leaned heavily towards freedom in similar cases. And the material that makes up most of Justinian's influential digest of Roman civil law. We see here there's still concern over kidnapping victims and a pretty generous attitude towards claims of free status. And the jurists who make up this body of influential legal opinion, they stress that essentially free status was almost inalienable. If you were born free, it's very hard to lose that status. The case of Pliny's Bithynian um, foundlings was particularly surprising because it was common to take exposed infant, infants who, after all, I'm sorry, they, otherwise they would die. In fact, some historians working on slave demography argued that enslaved foundlings must have been a key source of a majority even of new slaves in the Roman period. This, there is a problem, there's a demographic problem if you try to wrangle of how many slaves were in the slave system in the Roman Empire, how many the kind of economy needed in order to keep going. It's estimated that they need thousands and thousands of new slaves every year, in part because of low life expectancy. And also, you know, most people think that just natural human reproduction was not enough, especially since the genders of the Roman slave population were probably skewed due to female and male side, heavily in favor of males outnumbering females. Now, this wasn't a, you know, I'm sorry to be like sympathetic to problems of slave supply, I kind of feel weird. But this wasn't a big problem during the wars of conquest, during the wars uh, in the Republic, because war provided this. I showed you those figures showing, you know, war supply going into the south. Okay. Also, this trend continues in the early part of Augustus's reign. Augustus himself uh, and his lieutenants engage in a lot of new wars of conquest. Uh, for example, conquering the rest of the Iberian Peninsula, the Alps, big parts of Eastern Europe. After a stinging defeat in Germany, this expansion stopped. And uh, later, there was a few new conquests. There were occasional ones like picking up Britain in the 40s and 50s, conquering Dacia, or what's today, um, Romania at the end of the first century C. Um, and, you know, the Jewish revolts kind of provide, you know, s slaves because, unfortunately, the Jewish revolt failed, and um, there you have it. But overall, Rome didn't have a steady supply of slaves just from wars against, total wars against enemies, whether rebellious provincials or new areas they were conquering. And so where did the empire get the slaves that needed? There was an international slave trade. True, slave trade. There was a trade in slaves over international boundaries. And that's a lot like my Spartax Thracian example earlier. And it was fully legitimate. Uh, this international trade brought in slaves from Northern Europe, uh, from Southern Russia, Arabia, and Eastern Africa. But probably not in great numbers. The international slave trade also shows elements of what Romans might consider human trafficking. No few interesting examples of this. One case that comes near international human trafficking is another case described in a letter uh, between Trajan and Pliny. Okay. Here he describes a man who claims to have been the slave of a Roman governor in Dacia or Romania in Eastern Europe, and says that a foreign king of the Dacians kidnapped him, and then gave him as a gift to the king of Parthia. It's a very odd scenario he's claiming. And historians aren't sure if this guy's just like frantically lying to get out of trouble. Because this is all immersion because he is kind of run away and is in trouble. But it seems that Trajan and Pliny are interested enough in the details that he might be telling the truth that they're going to work on this process and end up considering. So this comes pretty close. The only problem here from my definition is he began his life as a slave anyway, so it's not 
doesn't exactly fit the definition. Interestingly, some of our best evidence of international human trafficking comes from late antiquity. The Christian writer St. Jerome preserves something of an oral history of a man who was kidnapped by Saracen, probably Arab raiders, and trafficked over uh, the international boundary of the Persian Empire in the 390s. This man is named Malchus. And uh, you can read this yourself in Jerome's Life of Malchus. And, and so it's kind of like taking down someone's oral history. Uh, he, he, gets, he gets kidnapped and dragged across this international border, but then eventually he could run away. He ran away and he resumed his life back in Roman territory as a free man. A parallel account, nearly contemporary, right around the year 400, is at the way other side of the empire. Britain. There's a young British guy who was kidnapped by Irish pirates, okay? Ends up being, you know, used as forced labor. They made this kid work as a shepherd for six years, and then you know what he did? He escaped. His name was Patrick. He converts to Christianity and come, comes back to the island of, of Ireland and uses the experiences of his enslaved where he would learn the local languages. Local customs, he uses that to help convert Christianity. <laughs> I mean, there's so many fairy tales associated with St. Patrick, and a lot of them are very fun. But this one, we have a manuscript that seems to be coming from him. That, and the story is, you know, it doesn't say anything crazy like him throwing out all the snakes or anything. It's, it doesn't have obvious legends in it. They think it's, it seems to be kind of a straight building. Okay. So we kind of have two, you know, eyewitness testimonies of like kind of autobiographical descriptions of enslavement over the international borders. And I would argue that these two cases of Malchus and Patrick, Patrick are unique in the entire history of ancient slavery, of a slave saying, here's how I was enslaved, here's how I brought out, here's what it's like. I don't know anything else about that. Okay. Well, let's return to our earlier question. After steady wars of expansion stopped under Augustus, where would the Roman slave market get the numbers it demanded? Romans generally thought of their slaves as coming from their own provinces, especially from places like Syria and the mountainous regions of Asia Minor. Literary sources from the early empire sometimes casually mention kidnapping as a way that someone might still become a slave. Here's a just casual mention. Oh, yeah, you know, there's a few ways you might become a slave. There's also kidnapping. Okay? Knowing what I said about Roman efforts against human trafficking, of course, it's not supposed to happen. It's improper, according to Roman definition of human trafficking. Okay? Um, but it did happen. I think it happened a lot. I think that kidnapping free people remained a major source of new slaves for the market. I think demographic historians have been too slow to dismiss that. In the previous part of my work, of my talk, I highlighted Roman efforts to fight human trafficking. And we should salute those efforts. I mean, we should give them their time. They're trying. They're making real efforts. Um, and then, frankly, the very existence of the empire alleviated the worst depredations like the eras of civil wars and rampant piracy in the Mediterranean. We also have to kind of look at the conclusions soberly and conclude that Maybe the Romans weren't very successful in finding human trafficking. Um, I'm, I'm making this famous argument saying that they approached it this way. I'm not saying that they did well. I don't think we can say that. Maybe they did quite successfully. I suspect that the chaotic but thriving slave trade of the Republican era was partly replaced by marauding within marginal, almost stateless, stateless communities in isolated areas, but areas that were more within Roman provinces and even in Italy itself, in what you might call zones of incomplete Roman control. Do you see this? This is a lie. This map is a lie. We love maps, but they're all telling a fiction of one thing or another. It's impressive, but it's kind of nonsense. You know, most of, most of this area, you have know, this, yeah, this big color red, that's sand. There's nothing here. Okay? And the Romans didn't think of the world this way. You know, this didn't really meet their picture. But we like pretty maps colored all red or pink. Okay? 
Uh, so the math is a lie. In fact, it would be better, more accurate, if large parts of the map were kind of faded out. Because Rome didn't truly control a lot of these areas. Even they kind of did, technically did, even though they did in paper. But that includes some of the desert frontiers here. Yeah, this is an emerging military frontier, but in earlier times, you see really incomplete land control. Another area are these upland areas of southern Turkey and southern Asian land. Places like Alzaria and Cilicia. Other parts were hard to kind of conquer and really control because they were wet and marshy. Like the marshes of the Delta had its own kind of weird issues. Um, even places real close to home, like Corsica and Sardinia, they have nice cities on the coast. You go a few miles inland, and you're in a different country. You know, you are very far from Roman control. Um, there's regions of Sardinia that even today are called officially Barbaja, meaning like barbaric place. You know, fairly uh, untouched by, by Roman power and, and previous powers too. Even areas near Rome itself, there's some swamps uh, that had existed in the southern part of Rome, and they were really a nasty kind of pine forest swamp. And you couldn't really live there comfortably because of malaria. That wasn't fixed until the 1920s. Mussolini's uh, engineering projects kind of drained those uh, palm time marshes. But it apparently was a place where gangs of criminals always hit out. Another interesting example of a kind of dropout community that, can, that exists pretty much outside Roman control are uh, the, the religious sects around the Dead Sea, okay? Uh, what I'm getting at here is the, the Dead Sea Scrolls community. Um, I'm gonna have to skip some stuff. I'm partly influenced by this book, uh, James Scott, The Art of Not Being Governed, in which he kind of looks at these kind of recalcitrant areas we kind of look down on from a, you know, a civilized point of view as being kind of uncivilized, kind of anarchist. Uh, but he argues that no, it's not like that, that they're making the conscious resistance of, against being incorporated into the state. It's, it's really interesting for me to come from the perspective of ancient history, even if he says himself about ancient history, it's not quite that. One thing he says is that Rome exercised a monopoly in the slave trade, which is not at all true. Not at all true. But let's think about these sects in the, in the Dead Sea Scroll. Um, they, if these are the people that Josephus calls the Essenes, one thing that's kind of odd about them is they don't want their own members to hold slaves. So if you could get into the Essene or Betsy Scroll sect and you were a slave, that's good for you. Essentially, it frees you from slavery from a Roman perspective. That's kind of like a slave trafficking, trafficking himself. Not at all what the Romans had in mind. However, they did it anyway. You know what? These people well, cut themselves off from society, set up their own community out in a uh, kind of deserted area. And they were not Roman legal inspectors knocking on doors saying, Can I read your bylaws to make sure they comport with Roman law? Which is not the way this minimalist well, Roman state uh, acted. I think these people even exercised the death penalty, which is completely illegal in the case of Roman law even though they're in the Roman province. And um, one reason they might be harboring, perhaps, runaway slaves, I mean, kind of taking away their slave status, maybe they're interpreting the Bible correctly. I mean, they, they are religious devotees of the Hebrew Bible. And, you know, in terms of ancient slave systems, the peachiest, the best, the most humane version of slavery you will ever see in antiquity, I think, is in the Torah. It is in the Jewish Bible. Okay. And, um, you know, this is a biblical heritage that Christians inherited too. And um, there is some evidence of the fact that, they, um, that, that maybe some Christian groups were offering refuge to uh, runaway slaves. That's a lot more dicey. Uh, we're really not sure. Well, I want to save time uh, for, for Q&A. And so I'm going to uh, just end by, um, you know, knowing there's a lot more evidence, some of which we didn't get to. One is an exciting letter from St. Augustine that was completely forgotten, unknown, until 1981. 
You know, you never know where you might find something in some weird monastery library. But this letter describes what's going on in North Africa in the poor twenties, where you have the return of marauding kidnappers and what seems to be the falling apart of Roman secular power, and um, how the whole area is getting kind of pillaged by these slave takers. I mean, it's kind of a heartbreaking letter to see how messed up things are getting. At one point, a bunch of Augustine's Christian bishop, a bunch of his parishioners go down, go down to a ship that's filling up with these prisoners, their own fellow townsmen and citizens getting filled up through the export them into a foreign slave market. And his own Christian parishioners violently attack these marauders and free these prisoners by force. So things are kind of getting a dice. This is right around the time, 5th century, the Roman power is falling apart in the last. Um, and I'll just end by saying something I like to tell my students when wrestling with the problem of Roman slavery. Um, what are these, by the way? Yeah, these are slave collars. We used to think they might be dog collars, but it's clear these are these are riveted collars chained on the human beings. Okay? <laughs> I like to tell my students this that when you study Roman slavery, study it with two minds. With one part of your head, try to understand what the Romans how they work on their own terms without including the value judgment. What made them say? On the other hand, don't lose your humanity. Keep your other part of your mind active too. And understand and using your human empathy to know, you know, how unnecessarily miserable some of these situations are. And uh, you know, if you were in that situation, you would probably run away if you could, you would probably resist. And that's what you do So I'd like to move on to that. Thank you. were of the slaves. They weren't just cattle or people. They must have had some skills uh, where they differentiated. And how were these slaves amalgamated into the uh, Roman society? Did they have slave markets? Did the Romans benefit the government? Okay. I, I'm going to repeat the question. Right, so he was asking about the demography of the Roman slave um, population and how they kind of fit into society. And really, it's really complicated. Is this something I said? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Romans had slaves from all over parts of the globe. They kind of tended to think of them, especially from coming from Asia Minor, for some reason. And they had interesting kind of stereotypes about slaves from different areas. They thought Greek slaves were wiry and smart aleck. They thought German slaves were big and dumb and uh, resistant to cold weather. They, you know, part of the kind of notion, they're kind of stereotypical notions of, of the world. But they end up in every kind of industry, and it's really, you know, requiring other few lectures to, to unpack. Um, yeah, they, they, there were slave markets, and, you know, a lot of them end up in agricultural slavery, just the worst, just kind of child slavery, you know, where... You're never going to meet your master. You know, you were you were kept in a plantation and, uh, you know, it was a miserable system. So it, it actually was a little weird. What kind of punishment could a, you know, a slaver in a Roman term receive? Oh, a slaver? Like, yeah, human trafficker. Yeah. Um, that kind of thing. Degradation. Actually, I, maybe I shouldn't say that so quick. The late antiquity laws are exceedingly harsh. And one interesting thing in this newly discovered letter of St. Augustine, he says, I don't want the death penalty. And in, in a way, like he wanted to kind of work with them or for them to have a more moderated condition. But the law was harsh. It, it really did not follow his slavery. Man. Ask what role gender played in slavery. You seem to have uh, emphasized uh, pirates and soldiers in the military. Are we to assume that you have 
chapter 2, which is on women being taken as slaves, or is it just they weren't important enough? No, I wouldn't say that. But what some historians think is that what, what slave owners wanted was mainly hard manual labor, field work, mining. Women did not work in mines. By the way, mining was tunneling underground and was essentially a death sentence. And you know, part of it is the physical difference that, that um, women, women tended not to have that kind of heavy labor job like working in stone for or something like that. Uh, so there's some really good historians who think that's one reason why the slave system is very skewed. I suspect they might be wrong. Um, first of all, really poor people in the countryside. They tended, women and women tended to do the same damn work. It was just trying to, to, to scratch a living out of the hateful soil. They were both scratching the dirt all day and trying not to starve. If a poor family like that, this is kind of interesting, if a poor family like that gets to be a little bit prosperous and they can invest in owning one slave, what a ancient family will tend to do is to purchase a female slave and have her do all the cooking and cleaning. Some of you hate cooking and cleaning. There's, just, there's been a universal desire to avoid it. And I think that that might mean that demographers are wrong in this point. I, I never meant to suggest that, that women weren't, weren't valued as slaves. Uh, they were. But a lot of people see certain occupations as being more Well, how about foster children? Uh, was, was it only boy babies who were considered worth saving? Or uh, were the, the girl babies just left Look. on the side of the meadow? Or yes. what? Yeah, I, I hate it. You know, I hate, I hate it. Um, but there is, to, to an extent, yes. Um, there, we have a letter on the papyrus from a father checking home. His wife is pregnant. And he tells her, if it's a boy, keep it. If it's a girl, keep it. That's just that's one piece of anecdotal information. But you can stack it with other things like that. The Romans at one point kind of cooked up a legendary law of Romulus, in which Romulus said that it was a this is a legendary first kingdom. You know, Rome, I think it's just a fairy tale, but whatever. But you know, supposedly Romulus had dictated that. Roads are not allowed to expose sons or the firstborn daughter. Uh, yeah, I think it did kind of work out. Um, so building off the gender question, uh, what about slavery and the sex trade? Is there documentation of that? Uh, yeah, she asked about slavery and the sex trade. Yes, that you know, it's depressing that that is a that is a role for uh, female slaves. They do end up in working in brothels. A lot of, a lot of, not all, but a lot of women working in brothels and other places where sex can be bought and, bought and sold were in this kind of trade. And um, so yeah. they're also uh, attractive young boys in the, in the sex trade. Too. Yeah, more than that. Um, so because Dallas was the center for most of what. Um, was the slave trade? Would you say that more slaves came from the eastern part of the Mediterranean, or was there another slave yeah. hub in the western side? What was the last part? Um, or was there another slave hub in the west side that would be? There a was, I mean, especially when Caesar unnecessarily invades France and northern Europe and just kills and enslaves a bunch of people. Um, but overall, I think the answer to your question is yes, it's actually more vibrant in the east. Partly because the East is more populated, it's got more states. It's an older, advanced civilization. They're, they're kind of easier for them to crack into the slave market, so I think it developed and laid out. Can you talk about children not really being valuable at a young age? Would you have That's kind of joking. Yeah. <laughs> when, when would children uh, uh, kind of become valuable? That's a really good question. Um, I mean, women can work. I mean, little kids can go out and work in the field and all that. I think I think stories stories like that now today. Um, but it's hard. One thing. I'm sorry. It's, I didn't know this when you said. Well, it's, uh, it's pretty depressing. Um, but you know, it, child 
child mortality is pretty high also. So, um, I don't know, maybe past the age of 16, 17, you really feel like, oh, this person is essentially an adult and, and fully valuable as a, as a site. Yeah. Uh, so you talked a lot about piracy. Would um, most of the pirates have been part of the Roman Empire, or were they part of? Well, no. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, they're in it, you know? They're in it. They, they're, they're supposed to be part of it. I, what I'm kind of arguing is, in fact, people are kind of dipping in and out of that reality. And, um, you know, they, they're, 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 they're in it breaking the rules. Um, so, yeah, it's complicated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, uh, you mentioned, like, a farming family being, like, prosperous and getting maybe one slave. So how much... It was a slave worth? You know, how, how did they get a, a lot. runaway slave? Yeah. More than, I'm sorry to call it in very concrete terms, it's it more than a horse for me. It, it's like a, it's like they get a pickup truck for a while. It, it's a real lesson. Uh, first of all, fascinating lecture oh, and, and timely, indeed, and especially to, to our own city of, uh, of, unfortunately, of Albuquerque, where uh, human trafficking. Uh, is actually pretty pretty prominent, and if you drive around, you can see billboards saying, "You know, report human trafficking." Um, that's a somewhat of a, a large issue here in town for law enforcement. Um, yeah, but uh, one thing I was curious about: you mentioned somewhat of an ambivalent attitude towards towards slavery in the in the Roman yeah. Empire to a certain extent, right? And I'm curious about uh, Patrick, St. Patrick's uh, own kind of 12 years a slave account of his own struggle in, in slavery. And I'm curious about what audience that, that, that would have been written for, just considering kind of the lack of general literacy in, in the ancient world. Would it have been ancient yeah. Christians, uh, small sex groups of people? Yeah, I mean, this is getting kind of to the point where probably Roman versus Christianizing on its own. I think they would have been read at church in the okay. they're, they're not terribly long. And yeah, you're right. Most people are illiterate, but you know, if you have one lecture, one reader, they can kind of share that out. Sure. I'm also getting outside of my expertise as I get into this But I mean, you can ask me. <laughs> would often outcompete uh, free farmers and that that was and you, you end up with the, the Black Eyed Brothers. Yeah. Um, so but there's also this is also a slave based society where you need a certain amount um, that you mentioned. You need a constant influx of slaves to maintain the workings of, of, of the underlying economy. So do you, is there any sense of at what point you, are the basic at what point do we have the basic needs of society of the slave society met, and at what point it, does social order start to break down as a result of That's that? a very good question. Um, <laughs> and I have no idea. But what I can just point to is you do realize there's an imbalance in certain areas where, where uh, enslaved people far outnumber the free. I'm, I'm kind of just pulling your leg a little bit with the Spartax. Uh, there was an actual Thracian slave, uh, an enslaved Thracian rather, who had been a soldier named Spartax. You know who that is, of course. Mm -hmm. That is Spartax. That was his actual name in Thracian. And, um, you know, he ends up being enslaved and he uses a gladiator, a lot of gladiators are slaves. And what was it, around 75 BC? He's in a gladiator school. He and some of his mates see a wagon full of weapons pass by on the street. They grab them and they run up Mount Vesuvius. And before you know it, 10,000 slaves have migrated there. They're just, you know, when you, when you have the sheer numbers outweighing, you know, Romans there, it makes everyone very, very nervous. And um, that slave revolt of Spartans in the 70s, I mean, that could have ended. Wow. It was really one of the greatest existential threats in the city of Christ. Yeah. Um, do you have any ideas why Rome didn't return to Nexo to fill in the slave deficit that they needed for future generations? Or? What do you mean? Well, Nexum, I think it was pretty much the Roman concept of 
That's slavery. Oh, okay, that's slavery. I don't know. Okay, they didn't like that slavery. They didn't like the idea of a Roman citizenship. Remember, they actually are very protective of this free status. One thing you do see in really desperate circumstances, and this is very sad, is people selling their children. Okay, you've got an example of that in Tacitus Book 4, Book 4 of the Anales, where the Frisians, uh, the Frisian people who lived then in what is now Belgium, their successors may live in what is now Netherlands today, started suffering unfair Roman taxation and started selling their kids. That's kind of what you get at the next one. And this, once people realize this, these, these Frisians were bold and they get away with it. And, you know, I think Romans end up revolted at the idea that people would sell themselves or sell their children into slavery. It does happen sometimes. But um, it's controversial. It's, it's, it's not pretty. And they don't like the idea of someone forsaking a free status. So that's how Yeah. Um, so you mentioned a lot um, the victor, right, enslaving the losers, essentially. So my question would be, it seems pretty apparent that the, um, I guess, how much, do you think it would be a sound argument to say that the slave trade could have acted as like a motive for Roman expansion, or sort of just expanding, is is the slave trade just a product of it? That is a big scholarly debate. Mm -hmm. that, we've been fighting about that for what, 50, 40 years? And the old view is, no. What you said was crazy and wrong. Haven't you read Libby? I mean, all of their reasons for expansion were high-minded. It was defensive imperialism. They, they had to fight that war. And um, around the year 1979, uh, the field started catching up with you know, the European, anti-European decolonization, kind of post-colonial history. And kind of reading some of these sources a little more quickly. This very uh, punchy book comes out in 1979, published by an important uh, professor in the in Paris, um, arguing that, yeah, how about that? If you look at the sources carefully, they know what's at stake. They know the monetary gain that's to be had. They're not stupid about it, and it motivated them for greed. And then other books kind of argue against it, and I think the right position is the squishy middle, middle where sometimes they were materialistic, um, you know, we're going to get the money and run. Other times they were a little bit more hesitant, we kind of dragged into the conflict. But it's a big debate. Yeah. How common was it for uh, either individuals in territories that were their own to have them conquered or dominated, or uh, Smaller rival states, various iterations of Persia. How common was it for people to realize that slaves were in high demand in Rome and set up their own sort of minor slave trade? They do. Yeah, no, they, they realize it and there is a market attraction. This is really hard to do because once once over you're kind of overwhelming boundaries, it's very hard to track and figure out what's going on on that other side of the frontier. Dr. Overton, by the way, is an expert on that part of the end of things. And he'll tell you better than anyone else how that can be challenging, but not possible. But we guess or there, there's various pieces of evidence that kind of show that, yeah, it kind of drew a traffic, and people think it probably led to a lot of local enslavement on the other side of the border. And you know, it's best, you know, they don't even know about it. So, if you were a free person and you traveled outside of the normal region where you live, how would you prove to someone you were a free person? Uh, that is a very good question. And ultimately, there is a document. Or one can be generated by you claiming it and it being traced back to the town where you have local citizenship. If you are from Albuquerque and you know southern Italy, and you are arrested in, in, in Rome, you'd say, oh, no, no, no. 
You know, you can't try me like that or punch me like that. I have Roman citizen status. You'll have to, you know, send a, a messenger to my hometown. Or this person who lives in Rome knows me. It's kind of a game of telephone and the Kevin Bacon connection mm -hmm. Where you can you can you can prove it and very often it will come down to a document. Families have family archive. And one thing that's really interesting is um, most people are illiterate, but the literate people are not stupid. They actually, some of them are very smart and they know how to use documents. You know, you know they kind of know somehow what in the archives, in the family archives, want. And so, yeah. So, I'm just going to show them what. Yeah. Did they, uh, runaway slave were uh, captured again. Uh, what punishments could they uh, face? Actually, this, this is an interesting story. You know, this wasn't put on every slave. Uh, what, what the real answer is, they are going to tattoo across your face. T-M-Q-F. Tene Or some variation of that. The people can see, no matter what you did, you couldn't brush your hair down over that. And it was an abbreviation that people would recognize that, that was a slave who had run away at one point. Then recaptured. And then branded or tattooed. Probably actually means tattooed. By the way, some of you young people you have all this express all these sorts of tattoos. You know, it's simple. I love it. Tattooing in antiquity was never like that. It wasn't the memento of the awesome spring break trip. It, 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 was, it was survival. It was some kind of humiliation or punishment. It was an old butterfly right here. Um, and so yeah, that that was a slave thing. And um because you couldn't get rid of it. They don't do that to every slave. They do it if you run away once and get caught. Because if you run away again, people are going to spot you right away. This is an interesting story of slave colonies. They are actually found after the Christianization. But they're more common after the Christianization of Roman society over the course of the fourth century. And there's a very interesting scholarly argument about why these start popping up after Christianization. And it might have to do with a Latin mistranslation of the Hebrew Bible, which says that God created humankind in his image. The way that can that kind of get garbled into Latin kind of makes it sound like people have a face like God, that our face resembles God, that our face is holy. And so what this one scholar argues, and has good evidence, is that Christian Romans ended up thinking that it's kind of like a religious crime to mark someone's face. You get a tattoo of the arm, uh, and that, but that is why you have these, these collars that are hard ribbed on. Maybe it's something that appears. Maybe one more question? Assuming that some slaves are worth more because of where they're from, what was like a to get slaves? Like, where did they come from? What are the hard to get slaves? Where they come from? It depends on what you want. If you want people to carry your litter, I think you want Athenians or Cappadocians. People really kind of like the, the slaves from the areas of Asia Minor. If you want a tutor to make your son clever, you want a Greek. You know, they're clever. They talk pretty words. Um, it, again, it depends on what you want. But it seems like the, the, the ones from Asia Minor are most popular. A great turnout and the very engaging Q&A. Uh, I would like to again thank you all for attending tonight. I'd like to thank the department uh, and the Gorm Fund for making this, uh, this possible. Uh, I'd also again like to thank uh, Kerman uh, personally. He was my undergrad advisor, so this is a great treat for me to have him here. Um, and uh, so once again, thank you, Dr. Kerman.